Come on, baby. Dad. Hi, one. Come on, Daddy needs a new car. Let's keep it up. That's do it again, boy. Do it again. Ah, six. We need a six. Well, maybe some of you are um, acquainted with this uh, game of chance. Uh, the uh, that game of chance, of course, is called uh, roulette. But uh, this game of chance, ah, yes, this game of chance is called craps. And there I got my six. I've won three times in a row. That's pretty good. And these little instruments you see me tossing are, are called uh, dice. The dice. Okay. An interesting thing about uh, uh, craps is it's a reasonably good game. In other words, just before I toss the dice, most houses have it arranged so that the probability of the person tossing will win is just slightly better than a half. Or given a slight change in rules, just slightly less than a half. So in a sense, it's a fair game so long as the dice are square. Okay, well let's consider now a, uh, a problem a little bit closer to uh, our uh, subject matter today, and let's consider the distribution of events which occur uh, when I toss a single die. Now when I toss a single die, well, the question is how often will I see a six uh, relative to a five, uh, relative to a three, and so on? What is the relative frequency of the outcomes of this particular event? This forms something called the multinomial distribution because there are many numbers showing up here. In essence, there are only six numbers showing up here. And we see a multinomial distribution on the board. The only outcomes are one, two, three, up to six. You can't have a zero and you can't have a 12. It's a discrete distribution. And you'll notice that uh, each one of these uh, outcomes uh, has the same opportunity of happening to all the others. Now, the relative frequency of a 1 is equal to the relative frequency of a 5 is equal to the relative frequency of a 4. There you have the uh, frequency density function. The mean of this frequency density function is 3 and a half, as indicated by that little arrow there. Now, that will bother some of you. Some of you say, well, gosh, you can't get a three and a half. But that's not the point. The issue at stake here is that the mean of this particular distribution is three and a half, although I quickly confess that it's impossible for you to observe a three and a half. Nevertheless, that's the mean of the distribution. All right, now what I wanted you to do is think in terms of two events that occur simultaneously. And of course, the usual thing is to uh, count the, uh, when we're shooting craps is to count the total and, and bet on the total. But rather than do that, I want you to consider the average. In other words, here I have a five showing the average of these two observations is two and a half. Here the average of these two observations is four and a half. And I want you to think now of the distribution of the averages. And here we see a uh, diagram of the distribution of these averages. Now it's possible to get an average of one, of one and a half, of two and so on, five and a half and six. And you'll notice that the, here's the distribution of the outcomes from tossing a pair of dice. Now the mean is still three and a half. And you notice something very interesting here. You notice that there's a tendency for the uh, frequency of the averages to uh, sort of peak uh, towards uh, the middle of the distribution. Now why is that? Well, that's easy enough to explain. How many ways can I get uh, an average of one? The only way I can get an average of one is to uh, toss a one on this die and a one on that die for a total of two or an average of one. That can only happen one way. Now how about an average of one and a half? How many ways can an average of one and a half occur? Well, I can have a two on this die and a one on that die, or I can have a two on the die on the right and a one on the die on the left. So there are two ways that you can observe a three, or if you will, an average of one and a half. And that's why the f relative frequency of the average, one and a half, is twice that of the relative frequency of an average equal to one. And so it goes. Uh, and as, as you can see, once again, on that, uh, di as we saw earlier on that diagram, uh, these averages uh, begin to pile up towards the center of the distribution. Okay, let's take more dice. Let's take four dice and toss them. And instead of considering the total, consider the average. Now, what would it be in this case? The uh, total would have been 18, 19. Uh, the average would have been 4.75. No, 19 divided by 4, yeah, 4.75, that's right. Let's do it again. That's 10, 13, 15 divided by 4 is 3.75. And let's continually toss these dice over and over again, and let's plot the relative frequency of the averages. And we see such a diagram of the relative frequency of the averages uh, here on the board. Now you'll notice this tendency for the averages to pile up towards the center becomes more and more profound. That's because it's very difficult now to get an average of one. How could you get an average of one? 
Well, you'd have to toss a one on all four die, and there's only one way uh, in which that can happen. So the average there, the total be four, the average be one. That won't happen very often indeed. But larger sums, and hence averages towards the center of the range, happen much more frequently, and we get that piling up of the averages into the center of the distribution. Now I have 12 dice here. And suppose and I were to take n equal 12 dice, toss them, sum up all those observations and take the average, and repeatedly do this, what do you think the distribution of those averages would look like? And believe it or not, Bob Ripley, you get a normal distribution. And we've shown that on the board here. You see that normal distribution of the averages. Now you remember what the distribution of the individual observations looked like. It didn't look normal at all. It was a multinomial distribution and quite discrete in its form and aspects. But when I plot the distribution of the averages manufactured from such observations, what happens? By golly, the old normal distribution comes through. Well, I tell you, I think we've uh, played at uh, these uh, modest games of chance uh, long enough here for the moment. And uh, so let me put this uh, stuff away. And uh, let's make, put ourselves into a more engineering or scientific environment, if you will. I want you to imagine we're in a laboratory now, and uh, we're going to be taking some data uh, on, uh, off a Geiger counter. And I have a Geiger counter over here. Uh, here we see a Geiger counter, and just to uh, show you, um, you hear it ticking away, and I've got a watch here with a, a, a radium dial, and sure enough. Now these outcomes, these counts that you hear coming off this uh, radium dial, um, if you'll forget about background noise, these counts that you see here have a particular kind of a distribution called the Poisson distribution. Now the trick about the Poisson distribution is a distribution of events which has been um, uh, derived from uh, strong physical and mathematical arguments. The trick is you divide the time axis up into little chunks, like one second or one minute or one hour. Let's imagine we take counts per second. Each second you determine the number of times that thing clicks. Okay? And we're to do such an experiment. Now I can actually show you the mathematical form in a picture of the uh, Poisson distribution without uh, too much trouble. Uh, here we see a, a, a graph of it. There's f of y. Once again, it's a, a discrete distribution. Uh, you can see that uh, occasionally we get no counts per second. Occasionally we get one count per second, two counts per second. Very seldom do we get seven counts per second, and apparently never do we get counts eight, nine, and ten, or so very seldomly that you can't record it on this graph. There there's a Poisson distribution, a discrete distribution. You'll notice its mean is equal to 2.25. All right, now let's imagine an experimental situation in which we're taking counts. All right? And each second I'm going to observe the number of counts which are recorded. Now these are counts of radioactive particles of a certain energy, and once again, please dismiss the consideration of background noise and so on. But what would our uh, particular uh, data look like? Now I'm in the laboratory, and on the first second, I determine, I observe the number of counts. And on the first second, how many counts did we get? Seven. And in the next second, we observed six. And in the next second, we observed eight. I'm gonna do this for six seconds. We got a four, and then I've got a three, and then we picked up a f five. Now, well, the total of all these observations would be 33. And let's talk about uh, these uh, six individual observations of the number of counts that we got per second. And don't consider the problem as follows. Don't think I took six seconds and counted them. I took a second and counted, and then I waited a while and took another second and counted. So these are the six observations which I obtained. Of course, those observations have a Poisson distribution. I happen to have uh, those uh, six observations right here. Uh, with their total of 33. All right, so the observations y sub i, the observations y sub i have a total of some of the y sub i's is equal to 33, and there are altogether uh, six observations. All right, now I'm going to compute the average. Okay, the average is a statistic. And the symbol for the average is y bar. That's a lowercase Roman y with a bar across it, and you usually just call it y bar. Y bar is the average, is equal to the sum of the observations divided down by n, and in this case, the average is 5.5, the arithmetical average of the observations, all right? Now, let's imagine that we uh, repeat the experiment again. We go back to the lab, wind up our equipment and start taking observations. In the first second, we observe, say, eight observations. In the second second, four, and so on. And let's imagine uh, recording the results from six uh, new seconds. And here they are. <laughs> 
right? In this case, the uh, total is 34. And if I were to divide down 34 by the total number of observations, 6, I would get the, an average of uh, 5.67. And you recall earlier, I picked up an uh, you know, average of 5.5. So here are the averages which we obtain from our experimental data. What do you notice about these two averages? Well, by golly, they're not the same. The averages vary. Of course they vary, you'd reply, because the observations which are used to contrive these averages are variable themselves, and of course the averages would vary. Well, now, what I've done, and we've gone back to the laboratory and repeated this experiment many, many times, as it turns out. And let me show you what happened as these data were being recorded. As I recorded the data, I began to plot uh, the outcomes, the averages. And we'll see over here on the uh, chart the uh, consequences of this. And then there are averages of six observations each. And you'll notice that the uh, first average came out 5.5, the next average came out of 5.67. I picked up an average of 6, I picked up an average of somewhere about 4.67, and I picked up another average of 6. And so you can imagine me going back to the lab and recording uh, six observations and taking their averages and plotting the averages. Now I did this several times over. Let's see the number of averages that I ended up plotting. Plotted quite a number here. And what do you observe about this distribution of averages? Well, it's the same old story, isn't it? The averages seem to be clustering, seem to be piling up towards the center, as indeed they must. And if you could imagine me going into the laboratory and doing this many, many, many times and getting hundreds and hundreds of averages and plotting them, what do you think happens as a consequence? And what happens as a consequence is we'll obtain a normal distribution of events. Now, that line there should have asymptoted down. It's just a matter of slight displacement on this graph. But the, we get a normal distribution of events, and uh, the averages tend to have that kind of a distribution. In point of fact, uh, we're up against a very important theorem in mathematics, and a very important theorem in statistics and probability, as far as that goes. And the theorem is called the central limit theorem. And it merely states the following. It says, regardless, well, almost, regardless of the nature of the distribution of the observations, uh, averages obtained from these distributions tend to have a normal distribution. This is called the central limit theorem. Uh, briefly, averages tend to have a normal distribution. 